Alhamdulillah. So I want to talk about things. This is our preprint on archive of exactly the same title. So uh, it's got a lot of stuff in it. And the theme here, we've been talking about all these ZTT inverse modules. There's a dual world with, where all the ZTT inverse modules become compact dynamical systems. And one can ask about dynamical invariants like the periodic point structure and the topological entropy, and they have something to say about topology. And this is something we've, it's been a long project of ours, and we did it for the classical Alexander invariance. It's been quite some time now, and we've now extended it to the twisted one. But since it's a new concept for um, people in this room who haven't heard us talk about it <laughs> year after year, um, I'm going to start out with the classical one to where everything's a little simpler and give you, try and give you kind of a flavor for the dynamics that's going on here. So, K, of course, is going to be a knot, and X is exterior, as we've had all along in these thoughts, and X prime, the universal billion cover. Let me remark that all of this does extend to links, but there are some complications, and so we're going to stick to the simplest case because I think there's, there's enough to do in this talk with the sim simplest case. So I'm going to allude to links occasionally, but uh, we'll stick with knots. And then lambda, again, is our of Laurent polynomials, and also by way of simplification, I'm going to be working generally over Z rather than other rings R. Um, and now I'm going to talk about the circle, the additive circle group on my Z. And so for H, any lambda module, I'm going to denote, well, we could really do the strange group, but I'm going to be interested in lambda modules. What we're going to be interested in is H hat is the set of homomorphisms of H into the circle group. And this is the Pontryagin. Did I spell that right? So generally, if you started out with a discrete group, this is going to be a compact group. And if you have this module structure, what you're going to get is a compact dynamical system. This is, this is our Those are just Z homomorphisms? Pardon? So in HOM, it's just These are Z. homomorphisms, yeah, uh, Z homomorphisms, right. Um, so these are group homomorphisms. So really, I should say H any, you're right, right here I should just say H any group. So when we do this, we're going to be thinking about this as a, these, I'm glad you mentioned that, these we're thinking of as group homomorphisms. When we apply this with this extra lambda structure, that's where we're going to get some dynamics. Uh, you want to be groups? And then uh, yeah, H, yeah. So we do want to do billion groups. Okay, so for what we're doing generally, our H that we're interested in is going to be our Alexander module H1 of X prime. Okay. And so as a group, this is just a discrete group. And then it's well known that this dual is going to be a uh, of course, it's a discrete abelian group. And H dual is going to be a compact abelian group. 
Um, so what's our topology? Well, we could make a sub basis if uh, rho is in H hat, then we could look at N sub A of rho is the set of rho prime, such that rho prime of A is the same as rho of A in H. So things that agree. Um, so let's see, do I need, I'm, I'm, this is, yeah. This is basic. This is going to make a sub basis for the topology, and it's going to be compact. Um, but now we have this action of multiplication by t, and so using the module structure, we're going to define a map which I'll call sigma from the dual to itself, which is going to be the dual to multiplication from. T, and what I mean by that is that if I take some rho in the dual, some homomorphism, its value, the value of sigma rho at A is going to be the value of rho at T. So that up here in H, we have multiplication by T, and down here in each hat this corresponds to the map sigma. And I'm using the letter sigma, sigma because it's going to turn out that we can think of it as some sort of coordinate shift in nice cases. Um, so what can we say about this? Um, sigma is a continuous uh, continuous automorphism. Sometimes, this is something we sometimes call the representation. Uh, 
function of k if we start out with with h being h1 of x prime for some knot, we sometimes call this the representation shift of k into the circle. So we've studied representation shifts into various groups, mostly finite groups of a circle group. And this is, this is a long thing we've been doing. OK, these have a natural, algebraic dynamical systems have a natural notion of equivalent, which is algebraic conjugacy. So, and algebraic conjugacy between algebraic, well, algebraic and algebraic systems, let's say they're called I don't know, y, sigma, and z, tau, is just an continuous isomorphism. So we have y, let's call it phi, going down to z that intertwines these actions. We have a sigma here, and we have a tau here. And this is coming. So we have a to go phi. And then basically, from, from this approach, it's easy to see that up to conjugacy, um, but it's fairly natural that this pair is going to be a not invariant. Just because it comes as a dual to a not invariant, everything we did is, is quite natural here. And so up to algebraic conjugacy, this pair H. H hat is And so that means that any dynamical invariance of uh, this dynamical system are also invariants. Periodic point structure, topological entropy, and such things um, become not invariants. Okay. So let's do some examples. Before I do any not examples, let's do this kind of an example zero. Let's look at lambda itself. That is a lambda module. And so what's at, let's ask what its dual should look like. Okay? So if we want to have a homomorphism from lambda to the circle, in fact, this is determined But remember that these homomorphisms are just group homomorphisms. As a group, this is generated by all of the t to the n's, freely generated by t to the n and in z. And so all we have to do is decide where in the circle we're going to send t to the n. So it's determined by choices of alpha sub n to be our row of t to the n, and these are all reducible values. And so if we let alpha be the sequence alpha n in t to the z, then this basically, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between elements of lambda hat and such sequences in t to the z. So basically, um, our lambda hat is going to be t to the z. What about our action of sigma? Well, 
if we look at rho of t times t to the n, that's just rho of t to the n plus 1, so that's alpha n plus 1. On the other hand, this is supposed to be sigma rho of t to the n. So that's saying that the shift, that, that this map sigma is really a coordinate shift map. So sigma is the left coordinate shift map. That is the nth coordinate of the shift of rho is the n plus first coordinate of rho. Okay, everyone with me on that? So, if, now let's get back to our Alexander modules. The easiest ones to get to from this are the cyclic ones. These will all have the form that H is lambda mod the classical Alexander polynomial. <coughs> then the dual, if the module is a quotient of lambda, the dual <coughs> is going to be a subgroup. Um, so, for an example, all of the two bridge knots are going to have a cyclic uh, Alexander module. So, since we've done a lot of examples with those, we you know a lot of knots with a cyclic Alexander module. Okay, so let's do the usual thing and start with the trefoil. And so our h is lambda mod t squared minus t plus 1, the Alexander polynomial. And then h hat is going to be some collection. Well, it's going to be the rows in lambda hat such that we need them to send that to zero. We need rho of t squared minus t plus one is zero. And in fact, we need a little bit more than that. Since we're thinking of group homomorphisms here, when we apply this to any t to the n, that also has to be zero. If we think of these, if we identify these with alpha, which is a sequence of alpha n's in circle group to the z, maybe I should be using a colon here. I'm not talking about a group of relators anymore, but a set with a condition. If you think about that, this is saying when we take our alpha, our nth coordinate here, and we take that and then it's sh minus its shift by sigma and then it's shift by sigma squared, we should get zero. So what we need is that sigma, sigma squared minus sigma plus one alpha is equal to zero. This is exactly saying that alpha n plus two Sorry, alpha n plus 2 minus alpha n plus 1 plus alpha n plus 0 minus n. And that's exactly the, the value that rho is assigning to t to the n plus 2 t to the n plus 1. Okay, so it's very easy in the cyclic case to go from the description of the module to the description of this dynamical system. Um, 
And note in this case that really what's, what we're using is the fact that our Alexander polynomial is monic, and being reciprocal, that means it's monic on both ends. Um, to find all of these coordinates alpha sub n, we just need two of them, alpha naught and alpha one. And then we cursively, we can go up and down by this condition and find all the other alpha. If you have a longer polynomial, it would be more. It would be more. It would be the degree of the polynomial. Okay? So alpha, the sequence alpha is determined by the pair alpha naught, alpha one, that's why it is an ordered pair. Um, in fact, for some reason, I would like to think of my vectors here. We're in a dual world, and Dan was talking about row vectors. When, when we start twisting, we put our vectors to the left of the matrices. I want to put my vectors to the right of the matrices. So in fact, what we have is that h hat is isomorphic to the circle squared. And I should even write my pair here my pair h hat sigma. So I can actually represent my sigma as a linear matrix. <coughs> and it's, I have to remember which way. It's basically, it's the companion matrix of the Alexander polynomial. And I have to write it this way rather than it's transpose. Because see what happens here if I take this matrix 0, 1, minus 1, 1, and apply it to alpha naught alpha 1, I get alpha 1, and then I get uh, alpha 1 minus alpha naught. And that just gives me my next pair of coordinates, alpha 1, alpha 2. special case here. First of all, we're talking about a fibered knot, right? So K is fibered. That means we have schematically, here's K and here's a ciphered surface S. We have a vibration. We can actually think of the knot exterior as being kind of a, a cylinder, you come around and attach one copy of S to another copy of S by some sort of a monodromy. And what happens in the fibered case is that this, um, that our H1 of X prime is the same as H1 of our separate surface S which in this particular example, since we have genus 1, is z squared. And so it makes sense that the dual is going to be the circle squared, because maybe I should have reminded you of this, the dual of z, hundred items of dual of z is t, because all you have to do is decide where in t1 is going. So maybe that should have been example 0, 0, and example 0. And so what I wanted to mention is if I take this matrix, let's call it M, if I take this matrix M, it has another interpretation. If we think of M as taking Z squared to itself, this is actually the action of um, the monodromy on the homology of the cyclic surface. So it's interesting. The same M, if you think of it as a 
transformation of z squared rather than t squared has this other meaning about, about homology. Now, for the trefoil, very special map, this is actually periodic. The monodromy itself, if you compose it with itself six times, you come back to something that's isotopic to the identity map. It's not quite the identity map, but if you restrict to the homology, in fact, you get the identity map. And sure enough, if you just take that matrix and take its sixth power, you'll find you get the identity. So this is a very, very kind of predictable sort of dynamical system. It doesn't mix things up. In particular, um, if we look at T squared with the matrix A, this has topological entropy equal to zero. What does that mean? Yeah, so topological entropy is a measure of complexity. Yeah, I was afraid this would come up, and I have to decide if I want to explain what it means. Maybe it's worthwhile. It'll take a minute, but basically it's a measure of how much your map is mixing things up. So a quick definition, if you have you, so let's, let's suppose we have some system, let me just call it y tau, a dynamical system, topological dynamical system, and suppose u is an open cover, and by n of u, we mean the minimal cardinality, sorry, minimal cardinality of a open sub cover, so that's what n will mean for any open <coughs> cover, what we're going to do is take a common refinement of tau to the minus k of u, k goes from minus n to n. Okay? So we're going to apply, actually for invertible things, it doesn't really matter, you can just go from 0 to n. Or 0 to n minus 1. So apply this map n times and see how it mixes up this open cover and look for the common refinement. Now, if this map were periodic, for instance, you'd see the same open cover over and over again, and so this wouldn't grow. But if this really stretches things out so that you start out with an open cover like this, and then you <coughs> apply t and it gets looking like this and you apply it again and it looks like this and so on, you're going to you're chopping things up into a lot of little pieces. So I'm going to take this number, I'll take its log and divide by n and look at a limit as n tends to infinity and we'll call this h of tau with respect to the open cover u. So this is giving an exponential growth rate. Typically, did I miss something? Um, no, in fact, in fact, the limit will exist. OK, that's a proposition. This limit will exist. It has to do with a property that uh, I think log of u refinement v is less than or equal to uh, n log n of u plus log n of v. And it's a, so that's a nice exercise, that this limit is going to exist. And then the entropy H of tau, we sometimes write H top of tau to distinguish from measure theoretic entropy, is the soup over open covers U of these H of tau. So this is this is old, old, very old work of Roy Adler and Klingheim and McAndrews students, at least some of those students in my advisor cover to me. Okay, 
Okay, so this is this is really measuring how these things cut each other up. And in a really simple example, for instance, if you take multiplication by two from the circle to itself. So this famous little chaotic map times two modulo one, then in fact this number is going to grow as 2 to the n. So when you take its log and divide by n, you just get log 2. To whatever base you like, information theorists take the log base 2. But uh, that's a matter of taste. OK, so this is topological entropy. Something that doesn't mix things up at all is going to have entropy 0. OK, once we've done one cyclic one, all the rest are going to work the same. So, well, almost. So if I looked at the figure 8, where our classic Alexander polynomial is t squared minus 3t plus 1, exactly the same story. Since the degree is 2, we'll get the 2 torus again. And this time our n is going to be 0, 1, minus 1, 3. Yeah, I guess I do. Um, so a well-known fact for toral automorphisms yeah. So let lambda i be the eigenvalues of m, then the topological entropy of this map, let's call it m, is going to be the sum of log plus of the moduli of i, where log plus of x is maximum of log x and zero. So in other words, just take the eigenvalues outside the unit circle. These correspond to stretching. And if you take the sum of the logs of the moduli, the modulus telling you how much it stretches, but we don't really care about rotation here. Um, it turns out that the modulus is what's really important then the topological entropy is going to be the sum of that. In this particular case, it's going to be just log of 3 plus root 5 2. Yes? Maybe this is just for the really nice two-bridge cases, but it seems that the matrix M that you get is the coefficient matrix sort of similar it's to what we were... It's a companion matrix of the... Um, Alexander polynomial. So anytime you have a monic Alexander polynomial if the degree is d, what we're going to get here is a d torus, and this matrix is going to be the companion matrix of the polynomial. And we were earlier we were coming up with coefficient matrices for the twisted case, and that might be a direction that you're going. Is that or in, in, in previous talks? Or we, didn't we see these big matrices? But what, what the, was that for uh, the Riley polynomial? We well, had for the Riley polynomial, it's just a coincidence. This might remind you of something in the Riley polynomial, but the minus one was somewhere else. Parabolic <laughs> rep of the Riley polynomial, one zero, minus one zero. Oh, so it's not the same. Thing. And for the, the figure eight, in fact, the matrix. Um, the representation for the Riley polynomial um, has a third root of unity in this place. And so to get an integer polynomial, we have to pull a trick of expand to a larger side. We'll come back to that. Okay, I'm sorry. OK, so I wanted to show a picture. I don't, this is not exactly the same thing, but another version of, so this is, I should have said, this is a hyperbolic automorphism of the two torus. That is, in every, a hyperbolic automorphism of the torus is one that either stretches or shrinks in every eigenvalue. No, no eigenvalues on the unit circle. 
emphasis stretching in one way and shrinking in the other, you stretch your square. Of course, this should be identified to make it two torus, and then we chop things up and put them back here, and you can see that your, your cat is actually mixing up quite a bit here. Whereas it wouldn't get so mixed up if, if we had all our eigenvalues on the unit circles. Did you have an animal by doing this? Um, I think this is all purely virtual. This is a virtual cat. So I think it's all right for virtual cats. Now, an interesting thing, I'm going to be talking in a minute about periodic point structure. So things should get more and more mixed up if you do this. And here's another example. You can see after one iterate and three iterates, things are getting mixed up. In spite of all this complication, there will be points which are strictly periodic. And in fact, the number of points of period R is going to grow exponentially at a nice rate, which we're going to talk about. Um, so this is, this is sort of a teaser for that. Um, it happens that if you do this with pixels on a computer, you've made the map discrete and all the points are going to be periodic. And for this particular pixelation, apparently all the points have period dividing 300. So if you, if you apply the map 300 times, you get exactly the same cat map. So this, it's Arnold, this, the term cat map comes from Arnold, who first had this idea. He drew a little cartoon of a cat to try and explain what this map looks like. Now, you not, not to try this at home. Yeah, don't, don't try this at home. Uh, it takes a very high-powered blender. <laughs> so, so anyhow, it turns out that for this particular map, all the, the well, any time you discretize this, all the, the pixels are going to be periodic points. And this is a common multiple of the periods of, of all, the, all those periodic points. It's, it's kind of cute. Uh, let's leave that up for a minute longer because one more example that introduces a new twist, so to speak, is when we have a non-harmonic polynomial. So, change the colors to variety. So, look at the twist knot 5-2, which we've also been talking a lot about. And so this is has Alexander polynomial 2t squared minus 3t plus 2. And so our h hat I can think of as doing the same reasoning I did before. We can think of it as some uh, set of elements in by infinite sequences of circle elements. And these have to have the property that twice alpha n plus 2, let's put the other stuff on the other side, is 3 times alpha n plus 1 minus twice alpha n for all n. Now, if you know alpha naught and alpha 1, in the circle you have two choices. For example, if these are both 0, 0 minus 0 is twice alpha 2. Well, alpha 2 could be 0 or it could be a half. And so instead of, the, instead of having two elements of the circle uniquely determine everything, uniquely determines up to a pair of choices. You can think of, so what I claim is that this is actually going to be isomorphic to, I had a notation, I think I called it sigma 2 squared, where sigma 2 is the dyadic solenoid. And one way to think about the solenoid is it's basically the inverse limit if you take the circle and map it to itself by 2, and then you just do this repeatedly, this is the inverse limit space. So above the circle, you have a doubled circle. One point has two points above it. And above that, we have four points and so on. And take an inverse limit. 
very interesting space. How many people know this song? Right? You, you heard about this in, in other places? Dynamic students tend to learn about it. Here's another picture of it. Another way of thinking about it is take the torus and then wind around, wind the torus inside itself twice like this, and then iterate that, wind it itself, side itself twice again, and so on. Iterate that construction, and the limit of that is going to be the dyadic sum. And so this has all sorts of properties. It's connected, but not pathwise connected, not locally connected. Um, is it path? No. Not locally connected. Very interesting number theory, because we also have an algebraic structure. When we think about it as we've constructed it as a compact abelian group, it also has. So, so it fibers over S1? Like with fiber, the cantor set? Yeah. Cantor set, fiber. Cantor, cantor set fibers over S1. So in this particular case, if you look at the eigenvalues, these have modulus 1, so we don't have any kind of Euclidean stretching on to give us entropy, but this total, always having another choice and another choice and another choice gives us a contrib contribution to the entropy. Um, so in fact, the entropy of sigma is log 2. It's the same entropy you get from a trivial sort of system where you just take if you just look at, at um, 0, 1 to the z with the coordinate shift map, that also has entropy log 2. The sim simplest possible case, you look at all possible binary strings as a dynamical system under shifting, that has entropy log 2. All the entropy here comes from that, that kind of shifting, that kind of having two choices at every place. And in the Euclidean direction, the direction of actual stretching, there is no stretching going on because the eigenvalues have modules. Okay, so a typical not case, these are two different extremes. Typically, you'll have a leading coefficient contributing some basically number theoretic, some p-adic entropy, and then you have eigenvalues contributing Euclidean entropy. And this is a point of view Doug Wind and, and Tom Ward and, and others have kind of developed for entropy of these algebraic dynamical systems. So it's a very pretty theory, and I just want to give some ideas of it here. Right. like this with arcs xi, xj, xk, and we have in H, we were looking at these relations, uh, xi plus cxj is xk plus cxi, and in H hat, we can regard this as being generated now as a lambda module. No, no, what am I saying? It doesn't make any sense at all. Um, so we can think of this as what we call base colorings of our diagram. So here we set x0, we trivialized x0. Here I'm going to put an alpha, so alpha i in 
t to the z. So this is a sequence alpha i n. We've got an extra subscript going here. And here I put an alpha j, and here I put an alpha k. And the relation we need for this to be an h hat is we needed a crossing like this, that alpha i plus the shift of alpha j is alpha k plus the shift. So just take this and put the dual over here. And one of these arcs, the zeroth arc, is going to be assigned to the sequence of zero. Yes, zero. That's zero. 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 Yes, zero. zero. Oh, zero. Oh, right, because we're a billion. Exactly. So this is a dual description. Um, this is the set of colorings. So these colorings are now going to be contained in t to the z to the n, where this is the number of arcs, I guess, minus 1 if you throw out the, the trivial coordinates here, which you could also think of as t to the n to the z, if you like that. So if you're looking at a presentation via a beauty group, a very good presentation of the knot, you can regard your H hat as living. I was going to go on to talk about periodic points, but I think maybe I should just go ahead and introduce the twisted version, and we'll talk about periodic points for the twisted and classical ones next time. Um, I think I can get away with doing that. Before you do that, I have a yeah. question. If the you only done examples of cyclic modules, and you could do direct sums of cyclics, yeah. that would be similar. Oh, so I should say, so we're going to have a theorem generally about the topological entropy. Um, so, let's see, you, you can't be sure of getting a direct, for a direct sum of cyclics. But for a direct sum of cyclics, given what you said, I think I could do some more analysis. And, and, but what about the modules that aren't direct sums of cyclics? Basically, there's going to be a um, finite, we'll have some sort of a quotient structure, right? Still get it. You get, basically, it's close enough to a direct sum of cyclics that, the, for instance, the entropy calculations are going to be the same, so. Well, I ask because it's a hard problem. Yeah. What, what modules occur as Alexander modules? Yeah. How do, so, for instance, do direct sums of cyclics have any topological properties that are, don't hold in general for Alexander modules? Uh, or top line, you mean when you take the duals? When you take yeah. the duals. Yeah. Do, you see, do you see any dynamic thing happening for variant spaces? I could look at the dynamic systems that arise for direct sums of cyclics. Yeah. And so I could ask for the sums. dynamic <coughs> systems that arise in general. Yeah. And do you get any properties like could you, so you could prove <laughs> You could prove to me that some knowledge is not a direct sum of triplets by saying, oh, look, it's got these dynamical properties, huh. and that never is as we saw. You could show, show there were no non trivial invariant subspaces in the system. I mean, the direct sum of the would be subspaces that are invariant. So you think the answer is yes? You got to show. You got to find a way to demonstrate this. And the second one is: if an Alexander module, we don't know what what Z of T modules are modules associated to knots. Do you have any special properties that, like you haven't mentioned point rate duality yet? Do you do you get any special properties from the fact that this arises from a knot. So, so far, everything you've done is just algebra. 
That's a good hard. question. We, we've spent some time, for instance, we're trying to think whether plans theorem really needs not theory or if there's, there's some version of it in a, you know, that comes out of the dynamics in the knot context. Um, so we've tried to think about what Poincaré duality would mean in, in dual to Poincaré duality. I, we haven't. For instance, just the fact that polynomial is symmetric. Let's say, do you know something about cyclic modules that doesn't hold for ones that aren't symmetric? Uh, there's, so there's, the, I mentioned these two, um, two kinds of, two contributions to entropy by, um, by Piatic and and Euclidean. Uh, if you had something, say, it was monic at one end and not the other, you'd actually see an exchange when you take the inverse. So if you take the inverse of this map, if you had a polynomial, if you're taking lambda mod 2t minus 1, if you move in one direction, the entropy is all chaotic. The other direction, the entropy is all stretching. That's very interesting. If you, if you're moving in the direction of multiplying by 2, then the entropy is log 2 because of stretching. If you move in the opposite direction, you're taking the inverse limit, the entropy is, is kind of in this. Yeah, yeah the question, I, but I, I don't know about the general question. question about whether the dynamic system if you reverse time, if you go the other way, is it's conjugate, is, is just as tough a question in dynamics as it is in, in not theory. So it's a question. Yeah, we also, we've also wondered about um, maybe what if we could use dynamics to show that a, um, a knot is not invertible? Because when you reverse the orientation on the knot, on the knot, you actually reverse. You take the inverse of the dynamical system because you're replacing two by two inverse. It's not quite what you're asking. I don't know. Um, now these are these are interesting things, um, and we've thought about some of them. I guess we haven't thought so much about others. So maybe I'll see if I can skip over here. And talk about the twisted version. And then we'll talk about theorems on growth of periodic points next time. All right. I started out with the, the definition in terms of duality, and we came up with this diagram, diagram coloring as, as sort of a consequence, another way of getting the dual. So maybe just to, to shake things up a little bit, also to introduce this in the most elementary way as possible, I can give a coloring definition, a coloring dynamical system, and then show why it should be dual to a twisted Alexander module. So I'm going to take gamma, a representation from pi to GL. So for now, let's say GL and Z. Um, we can do things with GL and R, where R is somewhere between Z and Q. We can still say some things about dynamics, because basically, What's going on here is we have a very nice dual for z, it's the circle, and for these things, there's, there's some nice number theory involved in taking the duals of rings between z and q. For instance, um, I kind of meant to say this before, if you take the dyadic rational numbers, z bracket and a half, the dual of that is exactly this dyadic solid. And so if you go back and, and look at this polynomial here, we can invert the polynomial over z adjoining a half. And so really h looks like z adjoining a half squared with some t action on it. 
Okay, but for now we'll take R equals Z. And so this is why we're looking at the total rep arising from parabolic SL to C reps of T which not. So that's one set of examples. And of course, if you just look at uh, permutation, perhaps finite representations into a finite permutation, we have integer. Interesting. Sorry, I can't read that. Total what? Total reps, sorry. Total representations. These things, once we define the, we talked about the SL2C representations, which look like x goes to 1, 1, 0, 1, and y goes to 1, 0, C1, where C was an algebraic integer. And we replaced, replaced these by something with the companion matrix. And part of it was because we wanted to look at the stool dynamics in a nice setting. Okay, so the diagram you might remember when Dan first introduced the twisted polynomial corresponding to these Rudinger relators. He had, he wrote down an expression that looked like xi plus t capital xi xj is xk plus t capital x, sorry, xk xi, where capital xi is by, by convention the image of gamma of xi. And he said, don't worry too much about what the x's are, the placeholders. But if you look at his homological definitions, in fact, we're really letting xi, in a sense, stand for any, any element, maybe a basis. Well, basically, these really are going to stand for something that looks like 1 tensor v tensor xi. These cells where xi corresponds to the, I, the, the meridian of this xi arc, and v ranges over a basis for a vector space. Capital V is r to the n. So really where these x's, what we should think of these x's are is kind of a set of basis elements for V corresponding to that XI. And so that's why in the relation matrix you built from that, you have, you have a whole block corresponding to that. It's corresponding to letting the, these XIs really range over a basis for V. They're really things like that. I'll, I'll write this down a little bit more carefully later. So what I'm going to do here in my dual world, again, I'm going to have alpha i, alpha j, alpha k, as I did before. So one of these alpha i's is a sequence alpha i comma n. But now it's going to be in the circle to the n to the z. So your gl n should be gl. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Since I'm using n's for subscripts, I should call that capital N here. Okay, so what I have, you can think of this as a sequence of vectors. These are all elements of Z, uh, T to the capital N. So each arc is being labeled by a sequence of n-dimensional vectors. And the 
relation I wrote down for you in the classical case, my, my coloring version of, of the dual looked like alpha i plus sigma alpha j equals etc. This is again going to be a vector. I shift a sequence of vectors coordinate wise. The, the shift The, the second subscript is the one that sigma is shifting. Um, so this is a vector. I'm going to hit it with the matrix capital X all the way. And here, alpha j, uh, alpha k. Um, plus, and then I shift by x k. I, I multiply, oh, I have to explain something here, x, k, sigma, of uh, alpha, i. One thing, parentheses, I forgot to say that when I write x times alpha, i, I may mean the sequence of things x, alpha, i, n. So I can let a matrix act on a sequence of vectors by acting coordinate wise on each vector. So all this really means is that each um, alpha i n plus x sub i alpha j n plus 1 is equal to alpha k n plus x sub k alpha i n plus 1. And this is To so a coloring a twisted coloring is an assignment x the i arc goes to alpha sub i and then based I just make the decision that alpha zero is going to be going to consist of the zero vectors. So we write this. The uh, set of gamma twisted, I'm sorry, my gamma twisted based And there are also dynamic colorings, but we don't want too many adjectives at once. Dynamic colorings because of the Z up here, basically. So, I think, well, we're sort of out of time, but just let me recall Dan talked about the based twisted Alexander module a gamma zero which was isomorphic to the first homology of the infinite cyclic cover. This was this a relative homology this was a meridian of the zero arc. So making it relative it basically corresponds yeah, I think to I didn't use that notation. You didn't yeah, use I that think notation? I just used X, X, M, and then B of Z. Okay. X, M, and uh, B. Why are you using Chuck's notation? B square bracket is the gamma. And so our claim is that these base gamma twisted colorings are just the dual of gamma, the dual of this. And as before, sigma, the coordinate shift 
corresponds to the dual, uh, corresponds to the action by the scene. Okay, so next time we'll justify that and we'll talk about growth of periodic points, which happens to be growth of torsion of and fold covers in the homology. And thanks. Are there any questions? Thanks again.